my title for myself is Linux Guy. In my day job, I work for Novell as a technology specialist for enterprise Linux servers. So um, I have to understand the source of where my paycheck comes from. So Novell pays me uh, be, to work with SUSE Linux Enterprise. But I understand that SUSE Linux Enterprise doesn't come out of a vacuum. That it starts up at the top with open source developers like you guys and like the rest of the community and hopefully like me too because I want to have community participation be part of my portfolio as well. Um, then secondly, obviously, we take that and turn it into OpenSUSE. How many of you have ever run OpenSUSE? Awesome. Okay. Okay. This one? Okay. I'm on. Is that better? Okay. So how many of you have used OpenSUSE before? I'll throw, I'll throw a few more out. I've got a bunch later, so, so hang on. I got a couple more. Who wants them? Yeah, here. I'll get, you'll get it. You've got to come closer if you want to get a penguin. I told you that, okay? So OpenSUSE, I'm, run, I'm currently running OpenSUSE 11.4. Um, and the difference between OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise that I get paid for, there's several differences. Um, this is Linux for enthusiasts and individuals, which would be us. And I would say uh, you are a Linux enthusiast if you can bear with a problem without having to call anybody and uh, suffer with technical previews and leading edge applications, which often is a euphemism for broken stuff. We include <laughs> a rich package set, a lot of things, a lot of projects in 11.4, uh, thousands and thousands of them, including uh, including some things that don't make it into SUSE Linux Enterprise. So this becomes sort of a foundation for us. We learn from what the community gives us in terms of feedback, and ultimately it ends up into SUSE Linux Enterprise. You notice the dots here. Anything that has a dot in it is uh, open SUSE, is the open stuff. And then the enterprise just has major numbers. So right now SUSE Linux Enterprise is at 11. So this is what we charge uh, enterprise customers to pay us for support and for maintenance and for relationships and, and people like me. So this has a very limited life cycle. This has a guaranteed seven year um, life cycle plus three years of self-support, so it ends up to be 10. And we harden this, and this is what we take to, to the IBMs and the HPs and and the software vendors like SAP for certification. This is what we build all of our training around. This is, this is the stuff that you and I get to beat up and contribute to and not have to call for help. Okay, so that's really SUSE Linux in a nutshell and now I'm gonna actually get into the appliance things. But I wanted to make sure I shared that with you all so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, so you can see Today I'm wearing my, my uh, formal shirt here, and underneath that I've got the project stuff, right? So this is, this is the way that we live. Underneath our, our real business is a lot of open source technology that drives it. So where do IT workloads run today? And those of you who have been around IT for a long time, you know that uh, the idea of a server being my application, so I, and Windows loved to do this, Microsoft just loved it to say, well, every app has to run on its own server. So now you've got this physical stack that's associated with the software. So in 2010, you still have 82% of workloads that are running on bare metal or physical hardware. About 16% is virtualized and 2% is in the cloud. And this is based on IDC and, and Gartner data. And we estimate that by 2015, those numbers will be drastically different, where uh, a significant percentage of portfolio is going to be virtualized, less will be physical, and obviously cloud will be some of that. 
So what our goal is in creating appliances is to really simplify software deployment. So if you're a software developer, do you want to make it really hard for somebody to install your software and actually get to the place where it's ready to use? Or would you rather do it some, some other way? So here, traditionally, this is how software gets deployed. So you have separate activities that are done by different people. You have one person who does the hardware build, another person that does the network setup, another person that preps it for the, for the OS, and then the other, another person that actually installs the OS, and then another person that actually installs the, the application on top of that and optimizes things for the application. And by the time you're done, you're four to six weeks in. Now, don't tell me that, that you've never seen that in the real world because I have customers that are there. I, I work with, um, most of my customers are Fortune 100 uh, customers. So I actually, I have one based in Ohio that's a Fortune 20, and they, that is exactly the scenario for their application deployment. It takes approximately six weeks for a new app to get deployed. And he, all along the way, it's got to val be validated with security. It's got to be validated with application setup. It's got to be conformed to certain change requirements and all the other stuff that's, that's involved with that. So it's complicated. And there's tons of procedures, and it's very expensive. And in the end, you have no absolute guarantee that it's actually going to be right. So. <laughs> So how about a different model where we create a, a flexible set of deployment uh, possibilities? So if you look at different appliances, you can see if I create one that's pre-formatted as a live CD or a bootable USB or even an ISO, uh, I can create a software deployment that's incorporated my whole operating system stack. Or I can pre-format it for VMware or XCN or Zen server or Hyper-V. So how many of you have VMware somewhere in your world? Yeah. How about Hyper-V? Anybody do that yet? Oh, oh good for you. OK. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> no one raised their hand. So um, how about Zen server? Anybody using that? Yeah. Uh, and KVM. Anybody use KVM? Awesome. OK. I've got a little KVM I'm going to demonstrate here later, too, so, so that's cool. <clears throat> so uh, in deploying, these roughly correlate to what we are talking about earlier and where everybody's going to have their applications. I don't want to exclude people that are in the cloud. I don't want to exclude people that are still installing on bare metal. And I certainly want to enable virtualization deployments to happen in a streamlined manner. So obviously, it increases agility. It will help you uh, get to the appliance that you want. That's a self-contained environment, really, is what the idea is. And it makes it easy. Uh, there's actually, VMware has a virtual machine marketplace where you can buy pre-configured virtual machines, or you can download free ones. Um, and that's just one example of ways for appliances to get deployed. And obviously, if I didn't say anything about cloud, uh, I would be, uh, I don't know, marketing remiss, because that seems to be the buzzword of the day. <laughs> so it does bridge to the cloud, and it gives you some ways to do that. And from the beginning with SUSE Studio, which we're going to be talking about just momentarily, We've been working with Amazon on EC2 type image deployment, so we'll talk a bit about that too. So Linux is obviously a terrific choice for building appliances like this uh, because we don't have the same license constraints that Microsoft does, and we don't care about resizing the, the OS and making that distribution the right size to fit around what my application purposes are. So there's business benefits, there's technical benefits, and this is the part that this weekend has really been uh, refreshing for me, to see some of the uh, relentless open source innovation that hopefully you guys uh, will continue to carry forward. So SUSE Studio is what I'm here to uh, talk about most. And I'm not going to talk as much as I am going to uh, demonstrate and show you what SUSE Studio does. Um, 
But we have, this is our mascot here. His name is Dister. Uh, we actually have a Dister suit in uh, Boston. Uh, I have a friend who wore the Dister suit for a while. He now works for Red Hat. He's not wearing the Dister suit anymore, <laughs> just to let you know. But SUSE Studio is the fastest solution for you to be able to build your own uh, application appliances. So um, we, we put to work somebody that you, whose name you might recognize. Have any of you ever heard of Nat Friedman? Nat Friedman? No? Okay. How about GNOME? Have you ever heard of GNOME? Yeah. Uh, so Nat Friedman and Miguel de Casa were two of the founders of GNOME. And they also started a company called Zimian. Before Novell bought SUSE Linux, we purchased Zimian. So those two guys came to work for Novell. And uh, so I got time. I'll tell you the story of how. Does anyone know the story of how GNOME got its name? Yeah, maybe? Yeah, OK. Well, so here's, here's what happened. Uh, Miguel and Nat were looking to start a simplified user interface that was totally free. And they wanted it to start with GN to go along with the GNU Linux stuff. And so Miguel, who is from Mexico by birth, is looking through the dictionary at GN words and trying to find something. And he comes running into Nat's office and says, how about GNOME? And Nat just fell off of his chair laughing because he didn't realize that the G was silent in, in GNOME and <laughs> because he's Mexican, right? I mean, you say all the letters in Spanish, you don't, <laughs> they don't have, it's not the same. So, so it became GNOME, and uh, it's because of Miguel. And Miguel actually still works for us. Uh, Nat has moved on to other things. But Nat's design eye is what went behind a lot of the interface things in SUSE Studio. So you'll see some rather uh, well-developed interface stuff, and that's the reason why, because we sent Nat over with a whole team of people uh, to Germany, and they incorporated some additional developers from, from uh, India in the process to build this thing. And it took them a few years, but it, it looks pretty awesome. So it allows you to build custom operating system images, uh, and it supports a number of different formats. Right out of the box, you can create any of these. And obviously, it gives you an easy way to deploy things, right? So um, this is not me but it's just somebody with appliances, okay? So uh, under the covers of SUSE Studio is, a, is the Kiwi project, which is actually a build package that can be scripted to help size the distribution properly. So if you take the base media, so let's say, for example, if I take SUSE Linux Enterprise or even OpenSUSE, and I try to do a minimal install from the base media, it's awfully hard to cut it down because, as all of us know, there are a lot of dependencies, and some of those dependencies are rather arbitrarily assigned within the package. So inside of a, an RPM, for example, and ours is an RPM distribution, in that spec file you say, build requires or requires. And the developer might put in there some things that may not really be required, but it would be, it would enhance the experience. And so those interdependencies, sometimes coupled with metadata or pattern type dependencies, end up making a, a bloated build. And when you're trying to build an appliance where all you have is the exposure point that you absolutely need to run your application, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I want to, if I'm, for example, going to deploy a database, I certainly don't want a web server on the same machine to be an exposure point because if I'm doing it all virtual anyway, I'll build another virtual machine to be the web server and optimize the performance for it. So Kiwi allows you to do that. And instead of making you work at the command line uh, Kiwi, with Kiwi, we built SUSE Studio for you to actually C. So uh, here's the SUSE Studio demo, and now I get to do the fun part. So, okay.
Yeah, we're in. Okay. So this, fortunately, you can't see my panel because it's run off the bottom. But this is uh, this is KDE running on a server. So um, I'm actually going to run a web browser here on my remote server. Um, That's my local one. So here's my remote server browser, okay? And I'm going to go to SUSE Studio. So when I go to SUSEstudio.com, and you can do this too. You can log in uh, a number of ways you can use, come on. There, better. Okay, so here's Dister, and it lets you create an account or log in. If you don't already have an account, it lets you create one. Um, if you already have one, it, it stores all of your builds. So the idea behind uh, SUSE Studio is that it's going to allow you to build your software and everything it needs into one appliance. Uh, you can create demo CDs, so if you're doing training and things like that, it's awesome for, for building that and putting on it only the software that you really want. Um, and obviously, we've gotten a number of recent press mentions. Uh, we were a finalist for Cody Award in 2010. We actually won one in 29. Um, so there's a lot of things, that, and we give out our own Dister Awards. So uh, once a year, you can actually apply to win some con content, uh, something from the Dister Awards. So we've had uh, a couple of winners. Um, the one that is a runner-up winner is Browser Box, and I'm I'm going to show you what Browser Box is here in a sec. Okay, so Browser Box I, I actually downloaded. This was created by an Opera person. Uh, it has. 22 versions of 13 different browsers on a single appliance. So if you're doing web type development and you want to see how it's going to look in a bunch of different browsers, uh, this is an awesome tool to be able to do that. So I downloaded the ISO that was created um, for Browser Box and I turned it into a virtual machine. So here on my own PC here, let's close that. I've got a virtual machine manager, and here, come on, here we go. You can see Browser Box 3 is running, so I'm going to go ahead and open this virtual machine. So here's Browser Box 3, and I'm going to resize to the VM. So there, now you can see it. And you can see on this box, he changed the, uh, the base screen, this is a KDE interface, and he changed it so that when I click here, my menu looks significantly different than it might if you were normally running. So he's got, uh, here's basically browsers, right? Firefox, Internet Explorer, Opera, a bunch of versions of that, including Opera Mini. So if you click on Opera Mini, it actually loads uh, an emulator screen, and you get Opera Mini in there. And you can go in here and type uh, flourishconf.com. Here it is. And it emulates uh, Opera Mini. So, and here you can already see that I've got Google Chrome open. I've got uh, an older version of Firefox open here. This is actually Firefox 2. And I have a new, newer version, Firefox 3, here. And even Internet Exploder. Oh my gosh. So, OK, so this is one example of how you might use it. And this is somebody who's won a dister. And these are freely available for you to, uh, to download through the, open, the SUSE Studio gallery. So the gallery is a place where you have all kinds of appliances that you can either share with others or that others have already made public. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in here. And again, it can link to an OpenID 
I just have mine set up to uh, connect to my Yahoo Open ID. And now I can look at my home account here in Studio and see here's what I've got. Okay, so it has a picture of me with my own account settings. I've used 5 gig out of the 15 gig that I'm allocated. But um, what you, when you create a build in SUSE Studio, you're actually building an XML template that can be rebuilt. So if your appliances have not been accessed for a certain period of time, the build is actually gone. But you can click on the rebuild button and it will remake it. So what we're going to do is a combination of things this morning. We're going to actually look at creating a new machine, and we'll look at one that's already made. So we've got a, this Flourish GNOME desktop, and you'll notice that I've changed the, the uh, graphics on it to uh, upload some of the Flourish graphics. So um, what we'll do is we'll start with a, a new one, and then we'll open that one up in a sec. So when I click on the Create New Appliance button, uh, I get a base template choice. So these are base templates that are already out there. Um, and you can see it's based on our distributions that are, that are current. So I've got 11.4, uh, 11.3 .4, of OpenSUSE. And I can even build enterprise ones because it makes you agree to an end user license agreement before you you uh, bring up the box, so there's no, no, uh, no issues with gen generating that. Obviously, I can select my architecture if I wish to make it either 32 or 64-bit, and I can give it a nice name. So uh, what we're going to create, what do you guys want to create? GNOME, KDE, server, juice. Juice sounds cool. Okay, so we'll make a juice. It's fast. It's kind of easy. And we'll start with 11.4 base. And we'll make a 64-bit because nobody builds 32-bit stuff very much anymore. Right. I mean, how many of you are still deploying P3 servers? Okay, there you have it. I was telling someone yesterday, I do my church's uh, computer systems, which might sound kind of cute and campy, except that we have 60 computers, eight servers in three locations. So it's rather complex. But our fastest Windows shares are being served up on a box that has a RAID controller and four SATA drives in a RAID 10. And uh, I serve up all those shares off of a Linux server that's joined to the AD domain. And does any the CPU and memory on that, uh, it's a P3 copper mine with one gig of RAM, and it averages about 2% utilization. So I really have no incentive to try to upgrade from that since it's running the latest uh, SUSE Linux. So I don't care, right? I don't care. So I'm going to name my appliance uh, uh, Flourish Server. Uh, on the 11.4, uh, the KDE 4, which version of KDE 4 are you using? 4.6. 4 6. 4 6. Yeah, because uh, it fixed a lot of KWIN things. If you're, if you're a KDE person, and I use KDE a lot, uh, 4.6 fixes a lot. So, okay, so you can see over here to the left, on my Flourish server, I have a dynamically changing, a da dynamically updating uh, section here that tells me how big it's going to be. Because we picked just enough operating system, you can see this is pretty small. Only uh, 400 meg of use space and actually 130 meg in the download, so it's pretty small. I don't have any patterns selected, but I have 29 selected packages, and then when you blow it out with dependencies, you end up with 149 total packages. And those of you who have ever installed Linux servers, you know that's not very excessive, really. 149 packages is kind of small. So here's what I'm going to look at. My software is the first selection in tabs. And you notice that up here at the top, I have software sources. So these are basically repositories. This is where my software is going to come from. By default, because we picked 11.4, 64-bit, those are, it, it will put both the uh, open source and the updates software sources in there. If I want to add additional repositories, 
that are uh, compatible with my distribution, it gives me this list of different ones that I could potentially put in there. And I can search for them. And these are ones that are publicly available. OK, so this is not including private re repos. These are ones that are available on the internet. Uh, Pac-Man is the uh, questionable codex uh, repository. <laughs> I don't necessarily want that. There's an additional LibreOffice one that will update it beyond what uh, is being uh, conjoined with the distribution. So if I want to get newer versions of LibreOffice than what shipped with 11.4, this one will track that in future. So that's what that is. And build service is referring to the OpenSUSE build service. So these are offered um, through us. And the Pac-Man is, is another guy. NVIDIA, these are actually proprietary drivers provided by NVIDIA. So you can add that as a repo if, you're, if you know you're going to end up running it on, on an NVIDIA box. Uh, yeah, um, question about the Susha Studio all the, uh, you know, in general. Uh, this is operating off of the web. Is there, is there a version that you can actually install in your own uh, network that is not uh, you know, cloud-based? Yes, and, um, we have an appliance toolkit. So there is a SUSE Studio on-site that you can get and customize it to your heart's content, put your own repos in there that aren't necessarily publicly available. If you want to do an individual RPM, you can click on the upload RPMs and put individual ones up there. And these, these are what gets used to resolve dependencies down here. So when you search for software, it's going to use whatever you made available to it to try to figure out whether I can do that or not. So let's say, for example, I want to make this a web server. So I'm going to actually type in LAMP here because uh, it's the old Linux Apache MySQL PHP. And you'll notice that in this list, I have one that looks a little bit different. So this is an individual package, and this is actually a meta package or a pattern. So if I click on that, it will, it will tell me what's included in those details for this package. So you can see in here, this is software to set up a web server. So if, and here's what's included, but it has these other recommended packages. So if I, if I really want to do this right, and I'm going to have Apache server, I'm, I'm going to want PHP and Apache. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and click Add All on the recommended software. So while it's doing that, it's working at resolving any dependencies and making sure that I add the ones that correlate over here. Now you can see over here on the left, I've got software changes. And here's the details. It added 111 packages to my system. Uh, if I click on the details, you can see all of these and potentially ban individual ones. If you're, if you're really brave enough to do that, uh, I'm not personally wanting to do that right now. So I'm not going to ban it. I can determine if it was a dependency of one of the others. It will give you a warning over here. And we're going to actually, that's a good question. So that leads into um, how can I break this and make it not work, which you might want to, OK? Well, you might not want to, but you might do it on accident. So I'm going to search for kernel here, and I'm going to cause some major confusion to this guy by adding the XEN kernel to this, OK? So if I click on Add for XEN kernel, it's thinking over here on the left. And let's see what it, what it tells me. It uh, should give me some warnings. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, it says, you've installed an XEN kernel. Don't do that. <laughs> because what it wants to know is, are you going to be an XEN client or are you going to be an XEN host? And you haven't told me that. So it gives me a, a warning. If I have something red here that's an error, I can't install it. It won't let me build the, the appliance until I resolve that issue. So I can actually click over here and resolve it this way. Also, over here is a yellow thing. And this is just a warning saying it's not recommended to install more than one kernel on your appliance. OK, so I, you know, it's an appliance. Why do you want to put a bunch of kernels in there? You don't even have a console. 
give me a break. So it was kind of a, it was intentionally to try to break it that I did that. So we're going to fix this by clicking on remove. And hopefully it's going to modify my software over here on the left and take away all those bad things and, and it's going to be okay. So that's software build in a, in a shortcut, right? Short way to do it. If I look at my configuration of the appliance, under general, I can specify the locale, I can specify a time zone, I can set up my networking a certain way. If I want to enable a firewall, I can. If I click on this, it will, it will uh, tell me that um, I didn't have a firewall. So um, because I picked Juice, right, Juice doesn't put a firewall in by default, so I can just click on the Add Firewall button over here and resolve my error message this way. So it's going to add a package, and now I don't have any bad, bad things anymore. It still likes me. So users and groups, you can customize completely. You can set up uh, whatever users you want. By default, it creates a username Tux, and the password's all Linux. You can personalize this by changing the logos or backgrounds and graphics. You can upload your own. You can change the startup. In this one, because we don't have a GUI, my run level's got to be run level 3, which is a normal console. So, on, but uh, you can also make it run level 5 if you actually have a GUI. Um, if you're migrating data from a MySQL or a PostgreSQL database, you can actually move the, the backed up database into a tarball onto the image, and it will deploy it that way. So it's pretty slick. Um, on the desktop side, if you're logging into a graphical interface, which I already have one shown uh, that I'm going to show you here in a sec, um, it automatically logs in as that user. Obviously, you can't auto-log in as root. Come on. Okay. So, um, and then under appliance, if you're setting this up to run in a virtual environment, Obviously, you want to allocate memory to it. Um, by default, it will allocate 512 meg and create a 16 gig disk size. And you can customize that entirely, right? And depending on which of those you're picking. You can even set up LVM if you really want to. Um, but if this is a single purpose appliance, you're going to, you should be able to uh, know how big your disk space is up front. Otherwise, shame on you. So, if you want to use LVM, you can, and I'm not going to in this machine. <laughs> Just to let you know. Okay, hang on. Back up to the top. You can also use scripts. So you can customize this with your own scripts that run either at the end of the build, which this one uh, populated itself, or, and you can also run additional scripts whenever the appliance boots. And we'll see an example of that in the other appliance that I've already built that we'll take a look at in a sec. Under files, you can upload overlay files. So if you put tarballs here and you tell it where to put it and what, what permissions to have, it will untar that when the machine is built and assign those permissions in that directory. So whatever you want to put on here, you can put them on, right? It's going to warn you if you run out of disk space, but you know that's your own problem. So, and then when I click on the build tab, it will let me build this. Now, by default, my default format is USB stick and hard drive image. But you also see in here, I can do an Amazon EC2 image, a live ISO, a preload ISO, which the example of a preload ISO we saw with, with the browser box because that was a predefined virtual machine. I created my virtual machine and it just took over all the disk that I had assigned to it and installed it. And, and that was it. So that's what a preload ISO is. And you can use any of these formats if you wish, or you can assign a default format and then add these other formats to be built as well. So I'm going to click on build here. We're not exactly sure uh, on versioning. The default is 001, which if you give somebody a 001 version of something, the expectation level is set pretty low. So, but I'm going to go ahead and build this. <clears throat> and you can see it says starting the build over there. And now you'll, you'll actually get to watch some of this happen down below. So it's it tells me what it's building. It's building a disk image. 
and it goes through each of the phases with a timer showing me how long it's taking to actually build this. And it says builds that are or older than seven days might be deleted to free up space, but don't worry, you can rebuild them at any time. So, <clears throat> so while this is building, we're going to go back and look at one that I've already built, just sort of like uh, the Food Network, right? So I'll pull, while I built this one, I'm going to pull this one out of the oven and we'll all look at it because it's already baked. So I have uh, my Flourish GNOME desktop here and we're going to open this one. It's loading, there it is. <coughs> So here's what it looks like, and you can see I've got Flourish imaging in there just because I could. Um, I've chosen some different software, so you can see my use space is quite a bit bigger, um, and my download is bigger just because I've got a full-blown X and GNOME and a whole bunch of other co cool things with it. And I've chosen some software. I haven't added any custom repositories or anything. Um, I've set it up to be in Chicago time. I've turned on a firewall but opened SSH, so, so you can SSH in. And I created the usernames to be the same. Um, I, didn't, I personalized it with the Flourish logo. Uh, I set my startup to be a GUI, and I actually set it to automatically log in as the Tux user. So when this appliance starts, it should go directly to a GNOME desktop. Um, and I've also set up a script in here that whenever this boots, I've got a certain permissions that I'm assigning on this guy, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. So I'm, I'm chmodding plus X all of my .sh files in user local bin because I'm adding up a script, uh, a, a file in here, a tarball to user local bin of all of my favorite script files. So these are things that I want on this box because I use these scripts all the time and they're my, my favorites, so. Yes. Wouldn't they already have execute permission in the tarball? So would you install them? Uh, potentially, yeah. I'm just doing it for illustration, okay? I mean, yeah. So thank you for that, you know. But if I click on the tarball, it actually shows me a list of the files within the tarball, which is, that's like awesome. I mean, isn't this cool? Do you guys think this is cool? Yeah. So I can see what's in my tarball already, so I know what I'm getting. I've already built this out a couple of times, and you can see I had some earlier versions. I had version 001 on here before, and I deleted it because it didn't work very good. So this one works, 003, I know. So I have the option of doing several different things here. I can view the files and see what's actually in it. I can download this guy, and it tells me uh, how big it's going to be uncompressed. Or I can click on the test drive button. So uh, we're going to pray that this works. On the weekend, occasionally, yeah, I get those. Hang, hang on, we'll try again. There are some VMs that are not, some test drive uh, slots that are not working right this weekend. There we go. Okay, so now we got one. So here's my GNOME desktop, and you can see it's starting to run it. This basically, it launches a KVM virtual machine on our server farm in Germany, and uh, then displays it for you to interact with directly. So you can see it's uh, running Kiwi and starting up my virtual machine. Now, by default, networking to this machine is off. So that means my only access to this test drive is through the console. If I click on networking, I can actually enable networking to this guy and it maps some ports through the firewall to let me SSH in. It will let me actually interact with a web server if I have one on that machine. So I can try out my web app and it gives me the, the direct URL to this, to this uh, running test drive machine. Now you notice that it gives, gives me an hour to test drive it because we don't leave the slots open longer than that, otherwise it'd be impossible to manage this. There are over 
500,000 appliances in SUSE Studio right now. And there's over 6,000 subscribers of people who are developing appliances within that environment. And just imagine if everybody's machine was open all the time, it would be uh, unmanageable. <laughs> It's just a, every, every time you test drive until, I mean, you can Yes, that. you have an hour for each time you test drive, right? Each time you launch a test drive. <clears throat> so it's not like it, you have an hour total forever for your life. It would yeah. be a hosting service instead of a built service. Yeah, exactly. And there's a reason why these, and that's one of the reasons why these appliances also do not have internet access, right? So you can't, like, use it as a proxy. Sorry not going to work that way. It's not meant to be that, right? It's meant to help you see your appliance in action, watch it run, and let it go, okay? So let's see here. I'm going to open another tab. So we're going to look at our server that we were building. And you can see that it finished, actually, one build. It says, uh, my Flourish server finished. It's only 221 megs, so that's pretty small. There weren't any errors in the build, or it would have, would have given me some, some issue there. But if I, if I go back and take a look at that guy, and look at my build. I can see, here it is, I can view files and see the entire log of the build, I can do whatever I want to with that guy. So here's my, <clears throat> my GNOME desktop is already loaded now, and I'm actually there, so you can't see the panel because unfortunately the bottom of my screen is not displaying well on the projector today. But uh, here I am on my box, so I'm going to say um, more applications here. I'm actually going to open a GNOME terminal. <clears throat> I can also send, uh, send commands to my box if I wish. Over here you can see I can send these control out commands to the box. So I can, I can get an alternate console like that. <clears throat> and I should get, yep, there I am at an alternate console. I can go back to the graphical screen this way. So here I am back at my, at my graphical screen, and uh, one of my scripts that I have is gwfix. So if I type gwfix and hit tab, there it completes it. So it knows that it's an executable, and if I hit enter, it actually runs. So we're going to take a look at my user local binder. <clears throat> And you can see all of those with the right permissions and all my SH scripts are actually loaded into this custom box. Now, um, what I want to do here, we're having fun, right? Everybody still good? <clears throat> so I've logged, I've uh, SU'd up to root. And what I want to do from here, uh, is I want to change something. I'm going to edit the Etsy host file. So here's my Etsy host. And I'm going to go down and add another host at the bottom here. 10.9.9.9. And this is going to be important host. OK, so I've added, a, I've added that there. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to type the word sync here, and there's a reason for that here in a sec. If I look at this modified files tab over here, it will load all of the changed files since I started my test drive. Now, I made a change to Etsy host that I want to persist. So I can actually incorporate this modified Etsy host file. If I click on the checkbox here, I can go to the bottom <clears throat> and tell it to add this selected files to my appliance. So I click on that button. It adds the overlay files directly to my appliance. And when it's done, now I go back to my build and look under files. And you see Etsy hosts is now added as 
something that I did. So while I'm testing this out, simply using a web browser, I can add configuration files back up. I can improve the, um, my appliance in future so it has incorporated into it all the changes that are important to me as a developer, okay? Any questions so far? Yeah, oh, a lot, yeah, a couple, yeah. Yeah, as you're developing these things, you, you keep referring to things that if you're including this, you should probably know enough to do that. Is there any bank of wisdom? Bank of wisdom. <laughs> with, with these suggestions and recommendations? Um, actually, that's a good question. So is there a bank of wisdom? Well, uh, <clears throat> there, yeah, yeah. Well, remember this is open source too, right? <laughs> we all love each other and we freely share things. So probably the, the easiest way to get started is to take something from the gallery. So you can see out here on this gallery, there's a LAMP server already built. There's a bunch of other things. If I want to search for something like LXDE, for example, people have already built and shared some base systems based around LXDE. If I choose this one and take a look at it, it gives me the choice to be able to clone that and add it to my own collection. So I can actually start with something somebody else has done and learn a lot from that. So if I click on the word clone appliance, it found an error. So <laughs> it's supposed to work like that. So when you look at the gallery, you can actually start with somebody else's. If you look in my home dir, uh, and this weekend I've been have, I've cloned one, but I've had a couple of issues like that. But this is one that I actually cloned that was out there. The lamp server is one that I took that somebody else built and put these logos and other things in there. So I can actually look at what he's done. And in fact, on this one, <clears throat> I've updated it. So that's another question that you always will have for appliances is that if I start with OpenSUSE 11.2 or something like that, how am I going to get to the later releases? Well, built into SUSE Studio is the option for you to be able to upgrade. So this was originally built on 11.2. <clears throat> I upgraded to 11.3. And then I upgraded from 11.3 to 11.4. So this is all currently done only on 11.4. Now, when it, when it does the upgrade, if there is dependency resolution issues for, so if there are certain repositories that were tied specifically to a previous version, for example, it gives you the opportunity to say, oh, I found this package in these other repositories, which one do you want to add to resolve dependencies? So it's really good about handling upgrades also. And because I include this in my software repositories, by default, I include the updates repo. It's going to have the most current versions of all the packages available for that distribution and architecture. And this is even true of SUSE Linux Enterprise appliances. So even though you're not subscribing necessarily to the updates, you can still build an appliance that's current, and it makes the end the end user agree to the EULA and then get their own updates after that. Pretty cool, huh? <clears throat> okay, any, any questions before I wrap it up? Because I think I'm about done here. Am I about done? Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions. So what you're saying is for any customization you do in, just like the prior screen you had there, you do customization in the is there a way to do a snapshot type thing so if, I, if my customization crashes, uh, I can make virtual by previous uh, builds? Sure, when I look at builds out here, this will list all of the different ones that I've done, okay? So I've got a 001 and a 002, um, and I can keep as many of those as I wish. Obviously, they're, if they're already built, they will show here. If they if they're not built yet, if they're just a template, they show differently. And I'll show you one of those. So here's one. This is one that this is my only shared appliance. It's not incredibly popular. It's only been cloned 11 times. So, um, but here's the build. So you can see on this one it says build expired. So this is one where um, this image is no longer live. I'm going to have to rebuild it in order for it to be there but I can always go back and delete different versions of this if I wish. 
I can add additional formats. All of these templates are retained out there as long as you want them. Cool? Thanks again for uh, your time and for the uh, patience while I was getting internet connection problems. And, uh, and uh, thanks again. Let me go back to my prezo here to um, make sure that I've, all I got is the last two, two slides here. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody.